Okay, so let's get started. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Scott Malky, one of the rock stars of the programming languages compilers world, coming all the way from Michigan to enlighten us. Uh, Scott has uh, done many important things in the communities. Um, probably responsible for Open Impact and Trimaran with some other people. Mm -hmm. And um, he's got many awards, he's uh, an IEEE fellow, and he's going to talk to us about approximate computing. All right, thanks a lot, Alex. So I, yeah, I'm from Michigan, and I was told it was sunny here, and <laughs> it's, it's raining out today, so I guess I brought the bad weather with me. Uh, currently in Michigan, it's probably about 40 degrees is the high, and we're trending downwards because we typically get snow, I would say sometime in November is a pretty common for snow, and then yeah, December, January, February are pretty miserable. So those of you guys living here in Southern California, you don't know what real weather is until you go to the Midwest. So, uh, so today I'm going to talk about um, approximate computing. And what I'm going to tell you is that it, it, it's actually a pretty easy thing to do, and I'll tell you what it is if you don't know, but you can kind of guess just based on the name. But the big thing is output quality. So how do we, how do we deal with output quality? So that'll be a big theme of this talk. So let's get started here. So when I, whenever I do a talk, I like to use mobile phone as kind of the benchmark as to where we, at, where we are at in computing. So if you go back to 1980s, probably your dad or maybe your grandpa, or uh, but they got these things called car phones, which were these awesome things. I remember my dad had one, and he's like, oh, I have this great phone in my car. And it, as you can see, it's a pretty big brick that you have to walk around with. And I remember the battery lasted for maybe, you know, if he, if he took it out of the car, he could keep it alive for like 20 minutes or so, and then he had to plug it back in. But anyway, so that was back in the 80s. So fast forward a bit, uh, where are we at today? So if you go back to you know, 2007, introduction of the iPhone, um, and then go forward to today, iPhone 8 is the, is the latest iPhone out. Actually, they look kind of similar, but if you look kind of inside, actually things have changed quite a bit. So processing capabilities, you know, we started with a single core at about 400 megahertz. Now we're up to six cores. They have two high performance cores and four low performance cores. What the frequency is is kind of, well, Apple won't tell you, and I think the cores are different, but I looked at Geekbench, and it's about a 73x increase uh, over this period, so that's a pretty huge gain. Uh, memory's gone up, you know, 16x flash storage has gone up. You notice the big one, the battery, is not going up that much. So this means as we build more and more compute in these things, we essentially have to keep the energy pretty flat because we're not gaining extra battery capacity as we go through these generations. Big thing that they're adding to these phones cameras, right? I mean, you go from 2 megapixels up to 12 now, and it's got both front and back, back cameras. Uh, you got video capabilities, lots of different sensors. So what I'm going to argue in this talk is that even though, you know, performance has improved by 73x, is that our ability to collect and generate data, you know, we're losing this battle. If we're building computers, we're losing this battle with people's ability to create data. So how do we deal with this? So first, let's, let's, let's talk about this creating data a tiny bit. So I've been involved in a you know, bunch of projects related to this. This was a project you know, a few years ago, maybe five years ago. But it was a DARPA project that looked at building, uh, you know, what would it take to build the next military UAV, and specifically the computer system within that UAV. So these are the ones that fly really high and, and take pictures, surveillance pictures, trying to figure out what's going on. So the compute they wanted was about 60 teraflops, and I'll tell you what that compute was doing in a second. Uh, power budget, 800 watts. So actually pretty decent. This is, this is an airplane, so you got the airplane engine to drive it. So this was a pretty decent power budget. And that gives you an efficiency of about 75 gigaflops per watt. So let's take off the shelf. What can we compare it to? So back in, you know, when this was done, the K80 was kind of the top of the line GPU. Uh, K80 got about three teraflops. Now you have to be careful the way NVIDIA, you know, gives you these, these kind of peak performances. What you can actually get is probably actually a small fraction of this, but we'll, we'll stick with their peak number of three teraflops. Power is about 300 watts for this GPU, and so about 10, so we're about a factor of eight short. And like I said, what you can achieve on a GPU is typically a, a fair bit short of what that actual peak is. So probably closer to a factor of 10, 15 short in terms of what we need. So what was this UAV trying to do? So essentially what it was called is called WAMI, or Wide Angle Motion Imaging. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to take these billion pixel images. So the plane is going to fly over, 
And what it's going to do is it's going to take these pictures, and then what you want to do is analyze these pictures to figure out what's going on. And the analysis is kind of a pyramid. So you start at the bottom, the raw pixels. So this is tons of data, trillions to quadrillions of pixels, because it's going to take these billion picture, pixel snapshots and it's going to have a sequence of these in a row. And what you're doing is, is what typical image processing does. So if you're trying to identify, you know, what are the objects in this image? You're trying to say, what are the objects that I care about and what can I ignore? Pop up the stack, we have what's called tracks. So tracks are trying to look at you know, the, spatial represent or the spatial relationships between uh, uh, these, these objects that are, that are inside your images. You go up and you're trying to identify what's called events. So now I got a bunch of these tracks, this, the, the spatial relationships. I can identify some event that's going on. And then finally at the top, what they're interested in is, is the actual threats. So they're trying to see, you know, is there an ambush going on? Is there a potential uh, you know, launching of a, of, of a rocket or something like this? So they're trying to go over these kind of territories that are you know, you know, a lot of you know, terrorist activities, these things, and trying to figure this stuff out. So interesting thing here is that you know, there's essentially a pyramid and an inverse pyramid. So the pyramid is the data, right? The data starts out really huge, and then you narrow it down into what you really care about. The compute is actually the opposite. So the compute starts relatively simple when you have tons of data, but then as you go up, this compute gets more and more and more, and that's where the 60 teraflops come in, is that you're really doing a ton of compute at these top two layers to actually figure out what's going on. And they want to do this continually in the plane. The plane is going to keep snapping pictures and figuring out what's going on. So another, another area where I think the data being generated is just going to be astronomical is uh, whole genome sequencing for humans. So if we look kind of at the history of genome sequencing, first genome happened uh, in 2003. The first human genome was sequenced then. It cost about $2.7 billion to do that. Fast forward to today, about 2 million genomes are being sequenced uh, this year. They, they've taken that time down to, you know, on the order of a small number of days. And the cost has gone down as well from, you know, billions of dollars to now thousands of dollars. But what I want to draw your attention to is the size of this data. So 200 petabytes of data are being generated, you know, human genome data. Now what they expect is in the next 10 years, this is going to go up to a billion genomes. This compute's got to get down to less than an hour, probably orders of minutes, because some of this is going to be used for like, you know, newborn babies to try to figure out what's wrong with this baby, what can we do to treat it, you know, other you know, adult patients as well. So we've got to get this time down because time is often critical in the treatments of the patients. And again, look at this data, 100 exabytes of data. So the amount of data being generated by this thing is just enormous, right? And it exceeds any kind of data that, you know, you just take all the, you know, videos on, on YouTube, all the pictures on Facebook. This outstrips this by, by a wide margin. And so, you know, if we want to meet these 2026 goals, performance-wise, about a 50x increase and 100x reduction in cost, and just a way to deal with all this data is going to be a big problem. So this is what I mean, that even though the compute's growing, the ability to generate data, that we can generate data, is growing at a much more rapid rate. So we really got to focus on, you know, what are we going to do to solve this problem? Okay. So typically, at least on the performance side, what people do, you know, you have this typical, you know, you take any hardware class you're going to see, is you've got a performance energy curve. And typically, you know, as you try to increase your performance, you're going to have to scale up this, 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 this energy curve and start paying more energy to get the next unit of performance. And this tends to be a bad trade-off. So what people do is they typically introduce this new z-axis here, the programmability side. So let's specialize. And specialization gives us a way to improve both performance and energy. So let's take a look at that. So what this graph shows is this is 20 chips from ISSCC. And what I'm plotting on the, on the y-axis here is the energy efficiency. So leftmost on this graph, you have your microprocessor. Right? Fully programmable, it can do any kind of application that you want. And then as you progress towards the right, you get more and more specialization. So this is kind of in the DSP area, so you're specializing for signal processing. And then these last ones are dedicated pieces of hardware for things like MPEG and things like you know, wireless communications, you know, 80211. And what you see as you go from left to right, you get about three orders of magnitude. Now, specialization is good. I work in this area. There's a lot of faculty here that work in this area. But the problem is when you start specializing to get that third order of magnitude, you got to know exactly what application you're going to be doing. And the problem with hardware and software is we don't know what the future application is going to be. The software is constantly changing. So therefore, you know, this approach has its limits. If you have, you know, MPEG is going to be the standard from here to eternity, we can, we can burn some special hardware for it. But if we don't know what the algorithm is going to be, then burning special hardware is, it, it is often impractical. Okay, 
So let's go back to our graph. So what else can we do? So let's say we don't want to go for sacrificing programmability. But what I'm going to talk about today is actually you can sacrifice another dimension called accuracy, right? So if we have accuracy, what we can do is we can improve both energy and performance. So it's basically scale that efficiency, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to sacrifice a tiny bit of accuracy. We're going to say that the application doesn't have to be perfectly accurate to gain this, this, this uh, performance and energy at the same time. OK, so where can we do this? So first up, what's approximation? So you guys, you know, images are all always a nice thing to illustrate what approximation is. So let's say you're doing an, you know, an image pro you know, a filter on this image, perfect image. But what if I ran the filter with just a little bit of accuracy loss? And you know, you probably can't tell much difference between those two images. So therefore, we would consider that acceptable. Now, obviously, we can go too far, right? If we start messing up the image where you know three fourths of it is just blacked out, that's not going to work. And then you can even go further than that if you get the blue screen of death which maybe you've gotten used to with, your, 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 with all your Windows stuff, but we really don't want to go to that far. OK, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to build acceptable. Now, we'll have to define what acceptable is, but we're trying to build acceptable systems out of unreliable or inaccurate pieces of hardware or software. And this is not new, right? Approximate computing's been done everywhere. You're using it today. IEEE floating point is approximate. Fixed point is approximate. JPEG, so all, a lot of these data storage standards are actually approximate. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at the compute side. Can we actually, in the, in the actual instructions that are being run on some data, make that approximate as well? So that's the new dimension here that we're talking about. OK, so where can you apply approximate computing? So approximate computing is typically done you know, in any domain where it's a statistical calculation that you're trying to do. The input data is noisy, or the output is human interpreted, right? So it's like a video that you're playing. It's you know some you know machine learning recognition of you know is it a cat, is it a dog, that kind of stuff. So there's some level of flexibility that's kind of built into the overall system. So image processing is key, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. But vision, robotics, any kind of multimedia stuff, a lot of the big data analysis where you're trying to figure out what's the meaning of the data, that's actually uh, contained in these domains as well. OK, so what do we have to do to kind of make approximate computing real? So I, I think there's two main challenges, right? So the first one is we have to make it run on commodity hardware. So what a lot of people are talking about with approximations, let's build special chips, right? So you know, everyone's coming out with their, their, their favorite machine learning chip or uh, you know, Qualcomm, IBM, pretty much everyone has one today. There's stochastic computing chips out there. You know, people are building neural accelerators. So these are very common. But if you look at kind of the domain, you know, we want to go from supercomputers down to cell phones and have this kind of more integrated into the, the, the computers that you use. And some of these chips will appear in these devices. They're already appearing there. But we really want it to actually run on you know, the core compute elements that are inside here. So your CPUs, your GPUs, et cetera. So commodity hardware provides lower cost and wider availability. Right? All those computer systems have these kind of process processors in them. And it's actually oftentimes less expensive to do the data computation in place versus ship it off to some special accelerator, do the computation, and then come back. So less data movement. And a lot of this data is pretty large. OK, second challenge. And this is kind of the main focus of the talk today. How do we manage error? Right? Error is pretty important. So you remember, you know, if we screw up the image like that, people aren't going to be very happy with our algorithm. And obviously, if we go to our blue screen of death, that's, that's terrible as well. So what we want to have set is a system that's configurable. So there's some knobs where if my phone battery is really low, I can crank this approximation up so that I can save battery life, right? So I want that setting versus I got my, I just charged my phone, I want this high quality video that I'm gonna have so I can watch it and enjoy it, then I wanna crank down the approximation and have very little approximation. So I need configurability and I need the ability to guarantee that I meet that, 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 that goal that I set. Now guarantees are hard. So let's not use the word guarantee. Let's use promise, OK? And uh, we'll, we'll go through what that means as I go through. But some strong promise on output quality. It needs to be robust and dependable if people are going to use this for, for everyday applications. And you're going to need what I'm going to show you is continuous monitoring. So you essentially need to keep track of what's going on with your approximate computing so that you know, do I need to adjust it up, down, whatever. Because sometimes these things behave a little bit unpredictably, so you've got to have someone kind of watching over your shoulder so that you don't crash into the wall. OK, so let's first do challenge one. This is an easy one, but I figure I'll just give you a little bit about challenge one. So can we perform this on commodity hardware? Well, 
Our approach to that is, well, if we're going to do it on commodity hardware, let's do it in software, right? Software runs on everywhere, so let's do it in software. So what we did was we looked at what were the common compute patterns in data parallel computation, right? Data parallel is a lot of these media slash you know, machine learning style applications. So we'll, let's look at what are the common patterns. So first one is a map, right? You take a data element, you do some function on it, you produce another data element, right? Then I have another input, I take that, do a function on it, produce another. So there's no relation between the you know, the contiguous data elements. Then you have things like partitioning, where actually multiple inputs affect it, go into a function that produces multiple outputs. Scanning, you're kind of scanning across a bunch of pixels or a bunch of data elements. You have scatter gather, stencil, this is kind of a sliding window, and then you have reductions that, that everyone's heard. So what we're gonna do is we're going to look at these different patterns and then develop specialized approximations based on what kind of pattern you have. By looking at the pattern, you kind of know what the communication is, and therefore you can optimize what the, what the approximation that you do is. So first let's look at the system, and then I'll give you an example of an approximation. So we just, we were working in, on GPU. So we did was we started with OpenCL and CUDA, built up in the front end of a compiler, identify the pattern. So which of those six patterns do I actually have? That's what I first got to figure out. And then we develop different approximation methods that are applied to those different patterns. Approximation. <laughs> yeah, approximation there. We got a little glitch. I don't know if I hit it. I think the battery's dead. Oh, is the battery dead? Okay, hopefully it'll be all right. Does anybody know what Should I lower this? light means? Okay. There's a yellow light. Oh, there's a yellow light on this thing. There's a battery in there. <laughs> I'm going to try putting it in my... Are you sure it's Okay, I put it in my pocket. Hopefully that'll be all right. Can people still hear me? Is the mic still on? Okay, awesome. All right. So one of the important things that we want to be able to do when we come out of this, out of this, with these approximation methods is have tuning parameters. So like I said, when your cell phone battery is low, you can kind of crank up the aggressiveness of the approximation. When your cell phone battery is high, you can crank down the aggressiveness to improve the quality. So basically, we produce tunable kernels, and I'll show you what that means in a second. And then you have a lot of time that's essentially going to monitor what's going on. This guy wanted 95% quality. I'm only giving him 85%. I better adjust these things a little bit. Or he wanted 90% and I'm giving him 99. Therefore, I'm overdoing what I need to. So let's crank it the other way. OK, so let me give you an example that we did for the, uh, for the map and it also applied to the scatter gather. So what we call this technique is called approximate memoization. So how many of you guys know what memoization is? You had your compiler class, you know what memoization is? So memoization means that I call a function, I remember the inputs, and if I ever call the function again with the same inputs, I'll just return the value that I cached before, right? So it's essentially a little cache of kind of the recent uh, uh, calls and their input sets that I have. Okay, so this is the kind of the main compute part of Black-Scholes. So this is a financial uh, uh, kind of a call put uh, um, uh, prediction uh, application where you get in some data, you crank out some computation on it. You can see in this in this graph, there's actually a fair bit of computation. Each one of these nodes is a arithmetic function. So you got divide, square roots, multiplies, etc. There's five inputs that come into this thing. You crank through the big computation, and at the end, you produce the call and the put result. So this is awesome, right? So this is perfect for approximation. You got lots of work that you're doing, and can I approximate this? I'll save a lot because I, I I can get rid of this computation. So with approximate memoization, what we're going to do is we're going to build a lookup table out of this. But instead of just remembering exact inputs, we're just going to remember kind of the best effort. What was the closest input that I saw before to, my, to these? And then I'll just return that value. So what we do, you've got your five inputs at the top. First thing we do is we quantize those down. So quantize those down to smaller numbers of, of values, right? So maybe this used to have, you know, it was a 32-bit number. We quantize it down to 32 different values or 64 different values. Then what you're going to do is you're going to pick off some bits from each one of these inputs. Let's take three bits from the first input, five bits from the second input, put them together into an address. Put those into a, an address and then look up in our lookup table and get the actual value that represents our best guess as to what this is, what this result would be. Okay? Get your, you get your output out, and then you just pull it out, right? So basically all that compute just becomes a address calculation, a load, boom, you got your result. I guess in this case, 
uh, maybe two loads because we have two, two different results. Okay, so first off, when can we do this? So what you're looking for is pure functions. So pure functions are essentially side effect free functions. They don't read or modify any global state. No calls to impure functions and no I.O., right? Because what you're going to do is you're going to pull that code out and replace it with a table lookup. So when there's side effects to this code, you can't do this. Now, in CUDA and OpenCL, this means no global or shared access. Typically, this is just on the store side, but if you can't prove that the load is, you know, the values are going to be changed in between, you got to constrain yourself there. And in particular, no thread ID independent, or no thread dependent computation, right? So you're saying if thread ID is 27, do this, can't do this, right? Because you're not going to, you know, you know, the table's not going to understand what the thread ID is. But pure functions are pretty common, especially in these kind of compute intensive applications. So first off, you've got to have a pure function. Okay. Now, what are the things that we're going to do with this? So kind of at the top level decision is how big is your table? And this is kind of your main trade-off between quality and speed, right? So you're bigger your table, you're going to get more accuracy because you've got more kind of spread of different values that you can look at. But typically your speed is going to be worse because, you know, if you have a cache or something like this, this may kind of blow out your cache. So, you know, you can start and you can kind of, so we do this offline to figure out what the basic size should be just by using some profile data. So what you can do is you can kind of go down. So if this basically was, you know, more than accurate enough, then you say, okay, I can actually shrink the size down. I'll go down to a smaller table and get more speed. Or I can go up on this curve. Oops. Sorry. I can go up on that curve, give me a bigger table, I'll sacrifice a little bit of speed, but I'll get my quality back up. Okay, so first decision is, how big's my table? Second decision is, well, I gotta remember, I'm gonna take my raw inputs, quantize them down, and then generate an address to look up in this table. So the way we do this, this is just kind of a made up example for three inputs. Let's assume that my table size chosen was 32K, so that means I have 15 bits for my address. So first thing I do is I just say, okay, five bits for each input. I'm gonna quantize each input down to five bits and then figure out what my accuracy is. So in this case, we do a measurement and we get 95.2. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna perturb, you know, essentially give one field more bits, one field less bits, and keep the other th third field the same, and then measure the accuracy for each one. And in this case, you know, you have these four <coughs> combinations, and this guy you can see is the best one. So we say, okay, that's actually an improvement, so we'll take that. Now what you can see is this is saying that the second input gets more bits. So actually the second input influences the output much more, in this case, than the third input, right? So that one's more important. So then you do the same thing, and we reapply this, right? Oh, sorry, go ahead. So in, in runtime, how are you measuring the quality? Uh, I will talk about that in a second, but basically what you're doing is you're going to do actual, approximate, and compare it, ah. right? So it's an expensive procedure, yeah. but I'm gonna tell you the trick on how we, how we deal with this. But yes, we're gonna to have to do it kind of this kind of, <coughs> this, this kind of um, diff sort of a thing. Yeah, it's essentially a diff, right? And it's expensive because you have to do both sides of the diff, right? So you don't wanna do this very often. But this we typically do, you know, you kind of have a small setup period time where you're doing this, right? So that's why you can do both during a small. If you assume a long enough running application, take a little small start part at the beginning and do this, that's how we're assuming right now. Question. Okay, yes, question. Why not just use a hash over the input data? You could use hash. So I think hash would be fine. A hash, we felt that this was, um, we wanted to have a breakdown of inputs and their importance, right? And I was worried about the hash would kind of treat everything more uniformly, right? But I think what, you, what you're saying is if you kind of go back to, you know, right now we look at, we basically just take bits and then or them together. It's a, it's a how much runtime overhead do you want to compute the address. So what you could imagine is once I figure out oh, three bits from this, two bits from that, six bits from that, then I could hash that to come out with my address, and that would be fine. This is a little simpler. You're just kind of pulling bits and shifting them over. So it's a, it's a trade-off between, you know, how fancy you want this to be versus how much accuracy are you getting. Yeah, question. So can you do this rather than... Uh, building the lookup table and computing the difference on the output, yep. can you essentially see it from the lookup table itself in that I see a bunch of entries that are neighbors, they don't have much of a difference, so maybe I can pull a bit from there. Yeah, that's a good point. So you, you're essentially trying to do an online kind of interpretation, right? You're trying to say, okay, I'm, I'm here, but let's look at the other values and then try to ex in, 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 interpolate the, the values. Yes, I think that would be a, a pretty good improvement. We didn't look at that. We looked at just kind of like, I'm gonna pull out the single nearest value. But you're right, you could basically go back, 
you know, and again, instead of I got an address, pull out a value, right? I could pull out the one before me, the one after me, take those three values and then combine them in some way. And again, I would say, you know, you can make this more complicated, you can make this part more complicated. And I think these are pretty interesting avenues of future research that we didn't look into quite yet. But essentially, yeah, you can drive up the accuracy pretty well with a small change here. I think that's 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 good. You gotta be super careful here though, because right, this is an example where you have a very big graph. A lot of times you end up, you know, let's say I only had this part of the graph. There's always these, you know, how much speed am I getting versus because the speed I'm getting is going to be the difference between what I save here and what I cost here, right? So it's pretty sensitive to, you know, how much stuff do you put on this side? And that's why we chose to be simple, because even though this example got tons of speed up by doing this, there's other examples where the compute graphs are a little bit smaller, so keeping it simple on this side of the fence was actually important. Yeah. So what I was actually referring to is if you look at, like, the lookup table at the end, right? Yep. And you see that uh, when I change a bit in one of the input components, I don't see too much of a difference. Oh, I suggest that I have more bits than I need. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, that's essentially yes. without having to look at the data. Right, I agree. That's essentially similar. Yeah, you're essentially saying that you have too much kind of resolution here, and you yeah. don't need as much. I can get, I can use that resolution yeah. somewhere else. That's essentially what this is trying to get, but I, I, I agree. I think it's, it's, it's similar because this is important because you're trying to say which inputs matter the most, which inputs matter the least. And let's zero in on which where I want to spend my resolution. <coughs> yeah. So I don't want to disturb the flow of your part. Yeah. But on one quick question, yeah. so to sort of form the mental model of what you're presenting, so yeah, yeah. To make it more clear. So what should I imagine as a use case of this? So I can imagine a situation where there's a time bound somebody gives, and you want to do approximate computation to the yeah. degree you can. Yep. Yeah. That's one aspect of it, right? So yeah. that, uh, is that what the right mental model for sort of what should I be imagining when I sort of hear you talk? So I think what we're fundamentally trying to do is to save work. So basically, I want to get to this compute point, and I want to do less work to get to that endpoint. So I could use that for DVFS. I could crank down my voltage and frequency, because basically, since I've cut down the work, I need less frequency to get to that point. I could perhaps run on, you know, like these new iPhones are coming out, they have low performance cores and high performance cores. So I could run on the low core versus the high core, because again, I'm doing less work. So we kind of took a more agnostic approach of, Let's do less work. And as a result, how you take advantage of that is kind of up to you. We just report it as a speed game right now. But you're right, in a real-time system where maybe speed doesn't matter, I just need to get the answer by this time, then basically you can elongate the method that you use to do the computation. Because any such overhead issue, like if I don't like the quality that you finally produce, yep, yep. I'll have to recompute, basically. Yes. So any such thing which is sort of trying to put think, 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 and then act, yep. has the overhead of think, think too much, right? So you sort of increase, so in progressive computation, that's what you're doing. Yep. You're sort of increasing the total cost. The, if, if I really wanted the final quality, yep. if I do it your way, it's going to be more expensive as compared to, let's say, doing it a different way. Not necessarily, but often will be the case. So I think what we do is we 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 look at profile data <coughs> offline to figure out when this makes sense and is it likely to produce safe. And then the runtime is kind of the fine tuning and the fine adjustments, right? So we've kind of pre-calibrated in some sense this, for example, this you know, this this loop here. What we figured out offline is we profile this data. And we know that a lookup table can provide some reasonable level of accuracy that's within our wheelhouse, right? And then the tuning is just to kind of slightly adjust it. So, you know, in some sense, I've cherry picked the problems that I want to apply this to by using profiling. And then I've kind of avoided the situation that you're kind of getting into. I think you're right. There will be certain problems where this doesn't make sense. You spend so much time, oh, the accuracy is too terrible, let's get rid of this thing, right? And those are the problems that we want to avoid, right? We're really shooting for the ones that these are kind of ripe for picking. This, this this table is representative of what this is. For example, like you know, for like square roots and you know sine cosine, so we use tables all the time, right? So this is really just trying to generalize that set of computation that you can apply that for. And if it's not applicable, we just chuck it and don't and don't use it. Yeah, I saw some other hands. Yes. So I, I think um, relative to what Sharada is saying, I mean, yep. if, if if another application of this is if if you're not on a phone. Yep. And you don't care too much about yep. cost, but if but someone's yep. given you a deadline, you must get an answer by this yep. time. Yep. You can actually use multi cores and do yep. a whole bunch of them in parallel yep. of various costs, yep. and whichever one finishes just before the deadline yep. is the most accurate you can do yep. at within that deadline. And, right. you just, and you just cut off cut off the rest of them and 
right. and throw them away. I think that's right. And if you kind of look at what the system's really trying to do, it's trying to produce essentially a set of kernels with varying levels of aggressiveness. And those could be the different versions that you're actually running. You have the super aggressive one, you have the super conservative one, and then things in between. So I think that would be a good use case for this. We don't necessarily care about the what is the actual, you know, what is the actual error? You sit, figure out what's the best one within a deadline. And I think that's a, that is a very good use case. We kind of were looking at it from the point of view of, I have a target quality, and I want to meet that quality as much as possible, and do it as fast as possible with that quality. But I think you guys bring up a good use case that, that could be done. Yeah? Um, I'm just curious, so your, your example here seems pretty obviously predicated on the computation being smooth, Yep. Mostly dependent on the most significant bits and so on. Yep. But you're not mentioning that in a direct way. So uh, is that on purpose or? So I think that's kind of, it, it, it not, need not be dependent on the most significant bits. What I'm saying is that there's a small number of bits in the various inputs. Are you searching that, for those bits or you're taking the top six or five or whatever? Right now, I would say we are taking the top and that's okay. good. In reality, you could search. Um, we are just taking, figuring out automatically do you want the first three, the first four, the first five, etc. Right? So we're figuring out what amount of precision you want, but not picking bits. So I think that that could be done as well. And a lot of computations are like that, but yep. some are not. Exactly. So yeah, I would say again that this depends on the applications, and you need to kind of be picky when you're applying these kind of transformations. That. You know, don't pick the, the, the fruits that aren't ripe, right? You gotta pick the fruits that are ripe. And it is particularly dependent. We didn't find this as a, we, we found this kind of lookup table approach pretty applicable across a pretty wide range of these kind of, what you might consider GPU style benchmarks, where it's a big computation on a matrix, on a vector, those kinds of things. So we found it common, but I agree, you could certainly figure out a space where this would be a disaster. So you definitely have to be picky when you apply this. Okay, other questions? Okay, let's figure out where I went. So we got past this. So then we essentially go down through the table. At this point, we get no, no gain, so we just realize that this was our best form. This is a greedy solution. This is focused on doing this at runtime so that you have to be fast. And oftentimes, you know, offline versus online, you know, you're gonna trade off between speed and kind of greedy approaches online versus kind of more, you know, I would say, larger searches and more global minimums if you're doing it offline. So we chose kind of the local minima, fast approach doing it online. Okay, so that just says where the final result is. So naturally out of this, you get inputs that matter less, get less precision, inputs that matter more, get more precision. Like this, like this was mentioned here, I think the bits matter. We take the MSBs just because, you know, that's kind of the easy approach. But I think, yeah, figuring out what bits you want is actually a good, good idea. Okay, so let me give you some results. So this is the easy part of the talk. So we did it in Clang. So basically, let's go into the parser, figure out where the patterns are, and then generate the various kernels with different approximations. Uh, we're running this, running results on real hardware. These are real benchmarks. So this is from the NVIDIA SDK, Rodinia. These are kind of the GPU benchmarks that are out there. Okay, so just kind of highlights of the results. What I'm just measuring here is performance. So like I said, we kind of use performance as a metric for less work. We're doing less work, therefore it's better. You can either use DVFS, you can use other you know, simpler cores. However you want to translate this into savings, you can do this. We just measured speed. We can run the CUDA either on the CPU or the GPUs. That's what we measure here. And kind of bottom line, you know, you're getting you know, 2 to 3x. It goes up to you know, 8x. And you know, we set the TOQ, the target output quality, to 90% here. So basically, you're allowed a 10% degradation, and that's where these are. If you crank that up higher, you can get more speed, meaning you crank, sorry, if you crank that down lower, you can get more speed. If you crank it up higher, you get less speed, depending on what kind of target accuracy that you want. I would say kind of the interesting here is what's that runtime system look like? And you know, you look at these curves, output quality goes up, speed goes down. So as you adjust those tuning parameters, you can see each of the various kernels here are, you know, as I crank down the accuracy, crank up the accuracy, I'm gonna lose my speed, but I can get better accuracy. As I reduce quality concerns, then I can get more speed. And there's a lot of times these things flatten out at some point, because there is some, you know, innate overheads of this thing where you will flatten out and I can't get more speed beyond this, this quality level. Okay, so let's move on to the second challenge, which I think is the more difficult challenge, and that's, can we manage the error? And I think this has been, been, been coming up. So one is the applicability of the kernel. 
So let's kind of set that assumption aside and say the kernel can be approximated, but it may generate various levels of error, right? Versus I can never get any speed from approximation. So let's kind of assume that we will get some speed for, for some level of approximation. But for the ones where I can get speed, can I manage that error? Okay. So if we look at, you know, what does the error look like for most of these kernels? What you end up with is a curve like this where there's a large percentage of small errors. But then there's a small amount of actually very big errors. So remember, you're targeting some average quality, right? And when you target an average quality, you get a, you get a lot of, you know, it's, a, it's essentially a bell curve, right? So you get a lot that are small, but then out towards the fringes, right, you're going to get some ones with big errors. So what we really care about is those big error elements, right? So if you look at our no error picture, you know, 10% of the pixels have 100% error. This, this image is pretty, pretty bad, right? Versus if all the pixels have 10% error, then it's actually, you probably can't tell the difference between the first and the last. Maybe I used the same picture, but no, I didn't. I actually changed it. But the point is, is these high error elements are what really matter because those really distort the image that I'm looking at. So besides the actual amount of error, another thing that we actually figured out is actually very input dependent. So my student was looking at, he found 800 flower images on the, on, on the web, and we applied a you know, filter to the flower, approximated version of the, bit, of the filter to the flower image. And you got this kind of distribution. So this is just the image number, and this is the error, right? So the mean is this, right around 5% error. But you see there's a lot of images that actually were much higher than that. In fact, some of them as high as 23%. And this picture was actually a whole bunch of flowers, so it was a pretty complicated one. Where'd you get others that are really awesome, right? This was just a single flower. In fact, the flower was the entire image. So you get varying levels of complexity, which essentially means the, the same approximation is going to be, behave differently when applied to that top image versus the one on the left. So I got to be cognizant of different inputs that are going to produce different amounts of error. OK, so how do people do this? <clears throat> so what people do today is across the x-axis here is time. So over time, what I'm going to do is at those dotted lines, I'm going to check the quality. And as we talked before, checking the quality is going to be run the correct one, meaning run the original, run the approximate one, and do a diff, right? And see what the, what the difference is. This is super expensive, right? Because you're not only doing double work, you're also doing the diff. So we want to do this not very often. So what we do is every so often, we do the check. If it turns out that we're being too aggressive, right? The error is too large, then we crank things down, right? Crank down the amount of approximation. If it turns out the actual the error is very small, and we could actually get, say, 10% error, then we crank up the aggressiveness. So what you do is you sample and decide, right? And then you actually have this period where you're not going to be checking at all. And what you assume is that the sample represents the next set of inputs, right? And then periodically, again, you come back and you sample, okay, was I too aggressive? Was I too conservative? And then adjust things. Now, what you can see is that it works well when there's regularity, right? When the sample is representative. But it's super easy to miss. In this case, the error got way above. So in this case, this was my target. And I essentially had this window of error, which was acceptable. Anytime I go outside that window, on the bottom side, I'm too conservative. On the top side, I'm too aggressive. You can see here, it's like the entire interval was producing these large errors, right? Which is sense of that image with the, you know, 75% of it's being black that could happen with this. So this system isn't great because you're not doing constant monitoring. And the reason that you're not doing constant monitoring is that these purple lines, if you did that all the time, this would be a big slowdown, right? It wouldn't be worthwhile. OK, so how do we do this? So we took inspiration from the, the Roomba vacuum cleaner. And so what we're going to do is we're going to vacuum up some of these, these, these messes. So this part deals with a, a it, it assumes that the approximation is run in an accelerator. But you can assume this is just the CPU as well, running the approximated code. The CPU on the left is the CPU running the actual unmodified code. And so what we're going to do is assume that the CPU is going to send over V inputs to the approximate version of the code. That approximate accelerator is going to compute what it thinks is the right output and send those results back. What we did was we built a detector, and I'll go into what this is. But what you can imagine here is that it's going to detect, and what we're looking for is those large errors. When, I'm, when, I'm, when is the kind of situation come up where I got really bad errors, where I can't trust what the approximate accelerator did? And when that happens, what I'm going to do is I'm essentially going to send it back to the CPU and say, hey, you recompute on this data using the accurate 
you know, unmodified algorithm because I can't trust what the approximate accelerator is going to do. So what you can imagine is that if you have a bunch of glitches in this picture, the Roomba comes in and identifies those glitches and just vacuums them up by rerunning those little segments on the CPU. Okay. So what you notice here is what we're going to have to do continuous online monitoring. This thing's going to have to be always active. So what this means is running the, you know, the non-approximate and running the approximate and diffing them. This can't do this, right? This has to do something a lot simpler than that because it's going to always be active. So we need continuous online monitoring. It's got to be lightweight because otherwise we're going to lose all the benefits of doing approximation. <sighs> so I'm going to talk about two methods that we try: input-based detection and output-based detection. Okay. So first one, output-based methods is the simplest. So you have your image, you have your picture at the moment we see here, and the pixels are red row, row wise. So oftentimes with image processing, there's is spatial temp or, or, or sorry temporal similarity between you know what pixel I'm reading now and what I'm going to read next and what I'm going to read next. The pixels don't change instantaneously, right? There's kind of more gradual changes. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the input, run on our approximate accelerator, look at is this temporally similar to what I recently generated. If the answer is yes, consider the output useful. If the answer is no, say the accelerator was messed up and I need to recompute. And I recompute using the exact algorithm. So what you're going to do is flag certain pixels or certain groups of pixels as being necessary to recompute. So what's this look like? It's essentially identifying anomalies, right? You got this bowl of green apples and you're looking for the red apple because you're saying, hey, something's wrong with that red apple. I got to find that. So detect sim temporal similarity when, it, when it's not there, flag it. So what this means is that I'm producing my app. So this is, consider this the output magnitude, this is time. I'm producing outputs. So I expect the next output to be right about there, right? So if that's good, then I count it as okay. When it's outside kind of this expectation, I say, hey, something went wrong here, I got an anomaly. I got to recompute. So check the history, see if it's within range. If, if it is, <coughs> count it. If it's not, don't count it. And so what you end up looking at is look at kind of what's the expectation of the output. When you differ from that, those are the ones that I flag. And as long as I'm not flagging too many, then I'm okay, right? I'm identifying these anomalies. Some of them may actually be correct data, right? So the cost of this is um, extra computation. So when I flag it, I have to recompute it, right? It's not meaning I'm gonna pass on this, this wrong output. So in this case, you notice there were three reds that were actually anomalies. I'll flag all three of those. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, if you look at the stock market, we use a moving average, right? Like they report moving averages for stocks. We're gonna do the same thing here. We're gonna report a moving average. So we essentially compute what's the moving average of this stock, right? So what do I expect it to be tomorrow, the next day, the next day? And then if I'm within that, some small range of that moving average, I count it as good. If I'm outside, I flag it as, you know, not good, and I recompute. So pretty simple. The nice thing about these output-based methods Super simple to compute. It's just a small formula that you do at runtime to compute the output value, expected output. You take the approximate output, and you just do a comparison and see how close that is. OK, obviously, this doesn't work if your output doesn't have the temporal similarity. If your output's going jittering like this, this method's going to be terrible. OK? So this is what we started looking at, input-based methods. So what's an input-based method? So imagine that you have two inputs, right? So this is the actual magnitude of the input. What's the magnitude of input one, input two, and I graphed it. And this is actually a heat plot. So we notice this in a lot of applications. There's actually kind of ranges of inputs where the approximated code actually has trouble, right? It's essentially kind of think of it as tough inputs and hard inputs. So in this range, the actual output is actually pretty complicated to compute. And maybe my shrinking it down to a few bits here, a few bits there, and a lookup table wasn't good. But in these other ranges, it was actually really good. So what we're essentially going to do is build a predictor that identifies where in the input ranges am I, right? Where is it tough to you know, train, essentially, an input predictor to identify these ranges. And then at runtime, check. If I'm in this window here, let's recompute it, right? If I'm in this window or in this window, then just go for it and count the, the approximate version is OK. OK, so it's pretty simple. Take your inputs, run it on the approximate accelerator, predict the error. <coughs> If you predict it as not high error, then the approximate version is OK. If you predict it as, as high, then discard it and recompute it on the CPU. So kind of like a branch predictor, right? You throw in your branch. You say, is it you know, taken or not taken? If I'm, if I'm guessing right, then I'm, gonna, then I'm good to go. If I, if I think it's going to be hard, then I recompute. 
Interesting thing that we noticed here is that this thing doesn't have to be super accurate. What, what I care about is false negatives, right? So a false negative is where this thing says, you know, the error is not high, but it is high. But false positives mean I just do some extra discarding and recomputing, right? So false positives are essentially performance overhead. False negatives are letting through a bad error, right? So what I really care about is the false negative rate, not the false positive. OK. And of course, this is, again, you're continuously monitoring, so that predictor better be low cost. OK, so one of the things that we did, so we did various predictors, but one easy one is just a decision tree, right? So you look at, in this case, the value of input 1 and the value of input 2, and you build a decision tree, and at the leaf is actually the error, right? And certain errors are going to be high, certain errors are going to be low, and therefore this gives me my predictor as to which when I traverse this decision tree, maybe this is too high, maybe this one is OK, right? So then I can classify, is it a correct, is it a, you know, approximate's good, approximate's bad kind of, kind of result. You can do this with various other kinds of predictors as well. Cost, obviously, with the decision tree is how many levels are you going through. The more levels in your decision tree, the more accuracy you get, but obviously the more cost, costly it is. For ours, we set it to a max of seven levels, because that's kind of where things flattened out and we didn't need any more. I think for different benchmarks, you may have to kind of change where do you kind of draw the line there. OK, so a few results again. Um, this was done on simulation, you know, Gem 5 simulation. Whenever you do approximate computing, one of the new things that you're adding is what's your error vector, right? So this is one of the kind of hidden challenges with approximate computing. It's not only figuring out how to do the approximation, but what, you know, what counts as you know, correct and how do I measure error, right? So this you've got to be really careful with. You know, typically, we try to use more standard error metrics here. But oftentimes, it's application dependent, perhaps even kind of code segment dependent, depending on you know, how you're applying. Um, so mean relative error is a very common thing. You can use SNR. There, there, there's other kind of common you know, error metrics. But that's an important thing when you're doing approximate computing. OK. All right, so let's look at a result here. So what this does is this, this plots how many elements am I recomputing? And it's percentage, right? So it's saying, OK, I recompute 100%, I recompute 0%. And the y-axis is there. So that star at 13% is essentially the unchecked accelerator. If you just ran it and you didn't check it at all, it would get 13% errors, OK? Now, this represents the ideal line. So as I start recomputing, so initially I recompute you know, some, some set of inputs. I'm going to run those in the correct version. And I'm going to drop down my error rate. And if I go all the way to 100%, I can drop my error rate down to zero, right? In fact, a little bit before that, I can get near zero. And so what you can see is if, if I wanted to, say, get my error rate down to 5%, then I would need to recompute. So in this case, getting my error down to 5%, I would need to recompute probably 10% in the ideal case of the inputs, right? Because 10% of those are bigger than 5%, so let's recompute those and drive that error down. All right. So then what the other bars represent, so obviously getting better closer to the origin is better. So these other lines represent the real mechanism. So the first one is uniform. It just says every second input I recompute, it. every third input, or two out of every three inputs I recompute. So this is really stupid, OK? And what it shows is that, yes, you can drive down your error rate, but to get down to that 5%, oops, to get down to that 5% level, it's going to be pretty darn costly, right? You're going to have to recompute a lot of stuff, and a lot of it unnecessarily, right? Because these aren't smart. OK. EMA, this is the output-based methods, right? So this is where you look for temporal similarity, and you say, was this temporally similar? And if so, if it wasn't similar, recompute it. If it was, don't recompute it. And you can notice this wasn't too great, right? At the beginning, it was actually no better than just kind of arbitrary randomness, right? And then it didn't drop down. But there's still quite a gap between the orange line and the dotted green line. So this output-based method wasn't good for this benchmark inverse K to J. The other two lines are the input-based methods. So this, this black line uses a linear regression model. So what you do is you look, do a linear regression between what I expect the output to be based on the inputs and what I got and, and compare it. So this actually tracked pretty well, right? It actually got reasonably close to that uh, uh, ideal line. So I'm recomputing less to drive that error rate down. And the last one was the decision tree. So this was kind of interesting. At the beginning, it actually did very well. So at the beginning of the process, the decision tree was better than the regression model. As we started wanting to get our error lower and lower, then the regression model actually outperformed uh, the decision tree, and what the microphone is going to do. So what does this really mean? So if I wanted to get my error rate down to 5%, right? what I'm doing here is if I do kind of the two out of every three, 
inputs recompute. You know, I got to recompute 62% of my inputs. But with this smarter input-based method, I can drive that down to 15%. So basically, we're driving down how much recomputation we have to do because we're essentially predicting when am I going to get high error and when am I not. Now, not all the benchmarks were like this. Some of the benchmarks are actually really easy where the output-based method was perfect. So this was a benchmark uh, gamma correction where you're essentially doing a filter on an image where you just look at the output. Basically, you just look at the temporal similarity of the output. And in this case, the EMA method was pretty low. There, you could get a little bit of gain with the output-based method, but the, or sorry, with the input-based method, but the output was pretty good. And the output-based methods are super cheap. So whenever you can use the output-based methods, do it. Whenever you can't, then you have to go back to the predictive method. Yeah. So in these experiments, have you fixed the first part, which is the approximation, at a fixed level, or is it, and then, then sort of playing with the recomputation, or yes. are you sort of doing optimization? Because it seems like it's a dual optimization. Right? You right. can optimize that and this. It is. You're absolutely right. So there's two kind of things you can do. There's the recompute part, and then there's the knobs of the aggressive. Oh, sorry. So for here, what I've done is I've set the knobs to one setting, which essentially said I got 90% accuracy average. Therefore, that's what the knobs are, right? But you're right, there's actually two sets of things you can do. You can either become, if you wanted to improve your accuracy, you could either get less aggressive or you could recompute. We didn't do both together because it, it, it's, it's, it's a challenge. So we basically helped, we, we, we did the knobs first and then we did the, the fix that and then do the, do the recomputation. But I think you're right, actually, both are in play. And it'd be interesting to kind of combine the two to figure out what the cheapest solution would be. That's a good point. Other questions on this? Okay. So let me show you first quickly the false positives, and the speaker is starting to make more noise again. Um, so what I told you was false positives generate extra work. So the uniform was 14 and a half, so basically we're recomputing a lot. The output-based method, the EMA, the expo exponential moving average, drove that down a little bit. But in general, except for a couple benchmarks, the output-based methods weren't that effective. But the input-based methods were actually quite good. It turned out that the decision tree approach was actually generally more effective than the linear regression. But in individual cases, the regression actually outdid uh, uh, the decision tree. OK. So let me move on to in my last 10 minutes here, what we're kind of looking at. So the first thing we looked at was some of the current research. So we looked at, could this be applied to neural networks? And basically what you're trying to do is saying, OK, I have a fabric of neurons. One option is to build a large uh, network that gets a certain level of accuracy. But what I could also consider doing is build a smaller uh, network with a checker. And essentially what the checker is going to do is it's going to bump things back to the CPU and say, hey, I don't trust the, 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 the uh, neural network on this one. You compute it using your kind of known standard you know, you know, C algorithm. So the question is, could this combination beat this one? And this is just a single example point, but, but you know, I want to kind of illustrate the power of doing this checking. So this was, again, that Black-Scholes where we did the, uh, um, the uh, lookup table. OK, so standard Pareto chart here, error on the y-axis, cost on the, on the x-axis. So if you just do everything on the CPU, meaning you do the exact version on the CPU, you get a cost of 1, and you get, a, you get a kind of an accuracy of perfect, right? So there's no output. Error. The first thing is kind of, what was the best network we could build for Black Shoals? And this was limited, I think, to two hidden layers in, in, in our network. So obviously, if we went more hidden layers, we could get better designs. But just you know, kind of going with this flow. So limited to two hidden layers. Actually, the best we could get was around 20% error. So this wasn't that great. Now we'll consider, so that's an example of, of one of the designs. So no checker, but it has a large uh, 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 neural net. These green dots represent, OK, a smaller net but I have a checker, and this is kind of the, I'm checking both, I'm doing the approximation with a neural network, and I'm checking with a neural network. And so an example here is, I, you, know, you can kind of see that the network size is kind of reduced, right? It's still two layers, but a lot fewer neurons per layer. But I have a, a checker, and in this case, the checker looks pretty darn big, because I think the checker was, I think overall, the, well, you can tell it's actually getting closer to the 1.0 cost. So there's obviously designs up here that didn't have quite such a big checker. And then the last set of uh, crosses here are the ones where I had a decision tree actually deciding, you know, is it too accurate or less accurate. But what I want to point out here is that you can kind of see, you know, getting down here in the low accuracies, the checker-based approach was really kind of our, 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 our kind, of, um, kind of solution here to actually drive that accuracy down versus 
this, right? Because obviously you can build bigger networks and drive that accuracy down, but that's going to again get more costly. Where these designs were often just a tiny bit more costly than those designs, but they're still driving that accuracy down. Okay. So, you know, where do we go? So obviously there's some potential for this checking with machine learning. So what we're looking at is, what about quality assurance? So if you think about what is quality assurance, right? If you look at any you know, automotive company or something, right? they really care about you know, you know, whatever they deliver has some lifetime of 10 years and we're not gonna get you know, huge problems in that, in that range. So what does it mean for machine learning? So if we're doing autonomous vehicles, right? We gotta identify, we got our cameras, we got our lights, we got other inputs. Um, maybe I should stop moving. Can I detect a pedestrian accurately or not? If I'm doing something like the genomics, right, I wanna do this analysis to figure out how to treat you know, this person with this disease versus that person with that disease. And the question is, even though the average accuracies are impressive, the individual cases can be scary. And oftentimes these systems produce large errors with very high conflict. So let me give you some examples of this. So this is for the, uh, uh, so looking at the ImageNet uh, benchmark suite, this is, this is the AlexNet network. What this plots is this plots a distribution. Just uh, turn it off. Should I turn it off? But I think they're recording it, so they need, they need the mic for the, the recording. It, it hasn't hold. been recording for the past half hour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it hasn't been recording. OK, fine. We'll just turn this off. Okay. So what this plots is this plots the confidence of my of my of the neural network inference and then what's the amount of error that I get so I'm essentially taking all the errors and saying so these bars sum up to 100 percent I'm saying 45 percent of the errors are kind of these low confidence predictions but what I really care about is what's over here on the right so the high confidence and the very high confidence and in this case you notice that 20 percent of the mispredicts coming from these high confidence predictions now, let's look at another network, see if this is just kind of an anomaly or not. This is BGG. So bigger network, a smarter network, so it improves the accuracy. But again, what you notice is that these two are pretty high. In this case, it's actually more than 25% of the predictions are coming in with high confidence. And so what we did was we looked at you know, a bunch of networks here. So now you're looking at CafeNet, which is essentially AlexNet, then the BGG that I just talked about, and then even more networks that are kind of improving the accuracy of the ImageNet database. And what you notice is the way that, so all of these networks, one after the other, get average accuracy improvements. So basically, as you go from blue to over here to purple and light blue, you're getting improvements in accuracy. What you notice here is the way they're getting improvements is they're actually improving these kind of low confidence answers. And that kind of makes sense, right? These are the easy pickings. I'm essentially trans translating low confidence and medium confidence into correct predictions. And that's how I'm driving up the accuracy. But you notice this bin and this bin actually, this bin is going up. So as we're building smarter networks, we're actually putting more high confident incorrect answers into these bins, right? Which causes us more problems, right? Because now the accurate, the, you know, the, the network says no pedestrian, but there's a pretty good chance that it's confident in that answer, but there is a pedestrian there, right? So how do we deal with these kinds of, these kinds of errors? Okay. So first off, you gotta kind of understand the scenarios, right? So scenarios are where this comes up. So obviously this is kind of a common case where you have a single picture that has two things in it. In this case, there's a mountain part, and then there's this kind of you know, lake part, and one of those is labeled as the actual part of this image that I care about. So this one's not too bad. So multiple objects in a frame, maybe I can separate that out and actually have two classifications for this. Another one is kind of the obstructions, right? This is a big one for autonomous vehicles, is that the thing that I care about is obstructed by something. In this case, you know, the, the alligator is, 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 is uh, uh, obstructed by the plants, but if you imagine like an autonomous vehicle, maybe there's a snowbank. Obviously, you guys don't get those here in Southern California, but we do in Michigan. There's a big snowbank blocking where the pedestrian walks. So obstructions are a pretty big deal. Other thing is similarity. So maybe you have a very detailed one. It's a hawk versus an eagle. We saw a lot of, you know, a bird versus an airplane. It couldn't tell the difference between a bird and an airplane. So you get two images that are kind of in the same ballpark, but maybe this one again is not too bad in terms of a, a, a you know, a, a, at least a pedestrian, because if I call both of those pedestrians, I'm kind of good to go. And then the last one is the quality of the training set. Obviously the quality of the training set for these networks matters a lot. So what are we looking at? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to apply some of the classic reliability principles, so reliable hardware design principles, 
two of these networks. So what are the principles? So redundancy. So you guys have heard of like DMR, TMR, like when you have a space, you know, computer in a space, you know, capsule or, or a rocket, they don't actually have just one computer in there. They have two, three, five, some odd number of computers that are all gonna run the same thing, make a decision and vote, right? And then we just go with majority vote. So redundancy is important. Another one is reduced functionality, right? So let's have reduced functionality, more special purpose type systems so that they're less complex and, and such. So we'll call those specials. And the last one is that we can actually do some pre-processing or decomposition of the inputs. For example, that picture that was a mountain and a lake, what if I separated that out into actually two points and then I could run both of those separately? So what our system looks like, so this is kind of ongoing work, so this is kind of just a sketch. But you know, imagine what you have is you have your picture of your dog coming in. First thing we're going to do is we're going to look at a broad classifier that tries to figure out what category, what kind of major category are we looking at. So in this case, we have this separated into this is an animal, this is a piece of furniture, this is a vehicle, you know, this is a piece of fruit, something like that. So you have kind of major categories. So that first classifier is just responsible for major categories. And then it doesn't mean just because this is a dog will just activate this. Actually, what we're going to do is we're going to activate all of these specialists and let them all make a decision based on this picture of the dog. So in the first case, let's say that the animal specialist actually figured this out dog, but this thing might be able to still come up with a prediction. Maybe it says the dog looks kind of like a table, so it comes out with a, with a table prediction. And then the vehicle, you actually had in this case, we, we stretched a little bit here, but you know, we've had a dog sled, which actually had a picture of a sled with some dogs in it. So it comes up with a prediction too. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna correlate, you know, this thing comes up with a dog, this thing comes up with this, this thing comes up with this. We're gonna look at a correlation of these things rather than just a simple voting to figure out, you know, what do I predict this thing actually to be? So what we're doing is we're combining redundancy. We're gonna have multiple of these specialists activated. We're gonna have more specialized networks that are each looking for just a small subset of, of uh, uh, categories versus all of the categories together. So we're specializing, we're doing redundancy, and then we're doing a combination. We could do this by voting or just by correlation, but we're doing some combination of these things such that we come up with better answers. So jury's still out on whether this actually drives down those misses. We're, we're working on this actively right now, but you know, our thought is, is that you know, we gotta do this because those high confident wrong answers are becoming more and more prevalent. And as we depend on these things for, you know, it's not just for fun, right? Where you put your images and, and it says, hey, that's children one versus child two, right? Or this is a dog, this is a cat. So it's not just fun, and when it's wrong, we don't care. When we're using this for self-driving cars, we're using this for, you know, medical, for, for making, uh, uh, helping doctors decide how to prescribe, you know, what treatments to prescribe, then we really care about these answers and we care about when we're wrong particularly. Okay, so let me just kind of conclude here. Uh, and I'm happy to take some more questions. But what have we learned so far? So when I first started, everyone was telling me there's a 2x ceiling on software approximation. You've got to go hardware. That's the only way to go. Hardware's the only solution. And so I think, you know, we basically proved in that wrong, right? And anytime someone gives you a limit, those are such fun to do, right? I remember back in the day when I was a grad student, you know, they had instruction level parallelism, no more than one and a half or two, and people were trying to shoot that away. And, you know, the same thing here. When everyone says, this is a limit, I don't know why anyone says this, but maybe to be controversial. But whenever they say it's a limit, you, you, try, to, you, you, you try to blow that away. And I think the, that doesn't mean hardware is not necessary. In fact, I think these two can be synergistic to work together. Second thing is this output quality. It's got to be the key to wide adoption. I mean, it's got to be invisible to the user to generate guaranteed results, or at least as close to guarantee as, even your computer is not guaranteed, right? It's 0.99999 likely to work, and 0.0001 likely to get you a blue screen, but it's good enough that you're willing to accept it. It's not applicable to all domains, right? We've got to focus on the statistical, the situations where the data is noisy naturally, that's where approximation makes the most sense. When you're checking your bank balance or when you're doing a stock trade or something like that, then this makes absolutely no sense. And then the last one where I think this can really help with these exabytes of data generated with genomics, right? And when we have UAVs that just generate billions and billions of pixels, big data has lots of opportunity for approximation. What you're doing is you're exploiting the symmetry, the patterns, and the similarity in the data, right? There's a lot of natural redundancy in that data, and that's how the approximation works, right? It tries to pull out that, those symmetries, right? And just focus on the, the, the relevant data. So I think that's why approximation makes sense in these kind of domains to generate you more speed, more energy efficiency, or, or just doing less work. And with that, let me conclude. Um, 
So, you know, the students do all the work. I just stand up here and take all the credit. Uh, there's been a lot of students working on, the, on, on this project over the years, and you know, they deserve the real work. Uh, I've been also been working with Jason Mars, Trevor Mudge, and Lindsay Tang at University of Michigan on this stuff. And my group is called CCCP. I guess with all the Russian scandal, this is probably not a good name. But when we defined it, we thought it was really cool. So there's actually no Russians in the group. I'm not Russian. Um, but if you want to check out kind of what we're looking at, uh, go to ccp.eeks.umich.edu. Thanks a lot. Enough time for two or three questions. Go ahead. Uh, so, oh, sorry. Uh, you had the mobile phones as a motivation. You know, yep. you want to reduce energy consumption. I think that's great. But yep. uh, one uh, question I have is, do you have any uh, numbers on will these solutions actually end up saving overall energy consumptions on the phone? Because, like we know, for example, a huge amount of the energy consumption on the phone is not for computers. Yep. For things such as display, Wi-Fi, network. Yep. So I'm wondering if we end up adopting the solutions, will we see significant benefits? Right. I think you're right. Whenever you look at a any kind of platform, you look at a even a data center. Right. How much is the actual compute? I would say in a phone, it's probably, we, we, fr we think about a third as the actual computer system, right? So it's a third display, a third, yeah, the radio and, and, and other stuff, and a third is the actual compute that we care about, which is CPU, GPU, and, and maybe some specialized accelerators. So definitely the savings will be kind of amateurized over how much does this matter. I think where I see it really mattering, and where we've been, we've been working with arm on some projects where essentially the continuous learning so basically you have sensors that are constantly gathering data that's where you really need to optimize right so phones make you know the reason that your phone lasts for a day is that most of the time it's in the standby mode and not doing anything right that's how we get the battery to last an entire day as we start moving towards more continuous monitoring that's where we got to see a big jump in efficiency and i think this is where this might play in We've been looking at things like, you know, essentially optimizing neural nets for, you know, lower energy, and that's where you can get, you know, essentially a 10x improvement, and that really matters, right? So I think you are going to see approximation in the mobile space. It will have to be amateurized across that, you know, one third of the problem I actually care about, or one third is what matters. But I think the always on is kind of a new paradigm. What people are doing today, so the way that, you know, the OK Google and the Alexa and everything works, they're building a special purpose piece of hardware that's always listening for that phrase, and then everything else is off except this one little thing that's on. And since it's so low power, therefore I can leave it always on. But as we want more functionality there, and we want the more always on stuff, I think that's where this could really shine. So that's what at least we've been working at. I think, you know, I, I think the other nice thing about this is that, you know, a lot of these things, since we're doing them in software or it's kind of a more general technique, it doesn't matter if it's phone or data center. I use that as the motivation because that's kind of the direction we're coming from. But a lot of times, the things that we optimize in the phone actually will matter in the desktop, the laptop, and the data center as well. Yeah. Okay, question over there. So when you started the talk, you mentioned independent functions or I, I, you call yeah. it the name a standalone function or something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. The pure function. Pure function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So it appears to me that sort of if you're using a system this kind, and let's say the larger problem, one additional problem would be if there are multiple pure functions and you're approximating all of them. Yep. A portion of a hey, <laughs> one of the quality of this do the overall quality, but you have to address that problem as well, yes. right? You didn't mention that. Is that I, something you explored? I totally agree. Yeah. That is on our to-do list, but I think that's a huge problem. You're right. So all the benchmarks that we looked at were typically single kernel, where that's what we're approximating, right? And that's the whole thing, right? Maybe there's some surrounding code, but there's one primary piece of work. I think you're absolutely right. As, as we start looking at larger applications, it's actually, hey, I approximate this, that affects this, that affects this. Yeah. Yeah. That is a huge problem. So what people are doing today is just feedback to the program. So they're basically punting this problem to the program, saying, we can generate you an error profile for this loop, this loop, this loop, and then you figure out how aggressive you want each one to be. So I think that's the state of the art. I'm hoping for something more automatic than that. But I don't have any solutions right now, because it is complex. Because you know the way I envision it is that some functions kind of shrink. You come in with a lot of error, and they actually convert that to a little error. Some functions are magnifiers, where they come in with a very small amount of error, and they magnify it. And it's really about identifying those magnifiers that are the problem child. So yeah, I think it's a fun problem, and I think that's something that's on our horizon. And it's tough, because real applications are not as simple as we looked at. 
we were kind of like, let's kind of identify a little sandbox that we can play with, but the real space is not like that sandbox. So yeah, I see that as a good future problem. Yeah. Yeah, in the back. Last question. Oh, and this guy had his hand up too. How about two more questions? Okay. They did simultaneous. Okay, okay. Tom is a nice guy. Do these functions take exceptions? Do you include exceptions between these functions? And, uh, different kinds of exceptions. Automatic, external yep. events. Right now, no exceptions. So basically, no I/O, no exceptions. Most of these were these weren't C plus plus. They were these were we were at least for the the. The software we're looking at CUDA and OpenCL, so it was more simple style of computation. Um, since you're running it on a GPU, there is no, you know, precise exceptions like on a C. So there's no kind of like divide by zero, and there's no kind of software exceptions when you kind of embed it in the C plus plus. So no exception. We just punted that problem completely. I think again, as you try to generalize the applicability of approximation, you're going to have to solve some of these problems. We kind of took the low hanging fruit of we're doing a lot of arithmetic. Let's fix those arithmetic functions so that we can tolerate some errors. But that's the easiest step. I think as you start adding in more stuff, I mean, even just into procedural analysis, we basically, most of our code was in a single procedure. You're going to have to look into procedural. You're going to have to handle exceptions. You're going to have to handle libraries. We punted all that stuff. And, you know, it's again, you know, you're trying to figure out can I get any solution to work even for the easiest case and then generalize from there? So that's kind of the approach we've done. Uh, on the purity of functions, I think you can just pass the state as an input to the function. That's true. And therefore, <coughs> eliminate that requirement. And then you would have to, I agree, you have to pass the state and then you have to have an update. If there's an update of the state, then the output of like the table would have to be what's the state update and what's the predicted output. I agree. I think there's a way to handle some limited state. I think when it gets, you know, when you're deleting elements from a linked list or something, I think it can get pretty messy. <laughs> but if it's just incrementing a global counter or something like that, I think you're right. So I think in the small, kind of the small state updates or small state reads, reads are easy. So if it's just reads, you're right, you just pass the state. If it's update, I think some limited cases could matter. But yeah, I think that's, as you want to generalize, you're going to have to handle situations like this. So I think you guys are both on the right track of, you know, we got to generalize this to handle more cases. And it's going to get more complicated as we do it. So I think the question is, what can we add that gets us a lot of gain in terms of usefulness, but doesn't make the thing too complicated in, in, in general? Because, yeah, since a lot of the stuff you're doing at runtime, the analysis part is done offline, so that's nice. But all kind of the tuning stuff is done at runtime. And so the more complexity that gets, the, you know, the more time over it's going to have. OK. OK, yeah, thanks, so thanks again. The password, the you know, cure is approximation. <laughs> <laughs>